got a uh, busy show today, just based on the chat. Everyone's ready to go on a Monday morning. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. Welcome to the BWI Live Show. Nate Bauer and Sean Fitz to discuss the blue-white game. Our reactions, our thoughts, our musings about Penn State football putting on uh, the largest display that even we got this spring into uh, what they've been working on. Some interesting things we'll get to throughout the show, including your comments and uh, your thoughts. No mailbag today. This is a quick turnaround from Saturday. This is going to be blue-white centric, but if you've got other thoughts, some things you want to talk about, and we're going to be doing a little bit of looking forward. So that's what's coming up on the show today. But first thoughts, I always want to get what's on the top of the mind for these guys here. So Nate, uh, after some rumination the last couple of days, what's on your mind about Penn State football here on a Monday morning? Oh boy, what is on my mind? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, look, I think I have some questions. I think I, I, think I have some questions. Uh, Look, the can you give us one of those questions? What, 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 yeah. What's what's kind of bouncing around in your mind about that? No, are they are they good enough? Right. That's the that's that's the yeah. question is, are they good enough? Uh, and, and it's and it's difficult. And we've been talking about this for really what feels like, uh, e- you know, 18 months, maybe. But going back to 2022, where there were low, not low expectations, but lower expectations, uh, you know, it was kind of this build up to 2024, right? It really, to, to me, that's kind of how I see this in this narrative of, all right, 2022, they exceeded a, yep. a bunch of expectations. 2023 was kind of like the, okay, it's Drew's show. This mm-hmm. is now we're going to push the kid on the two wheeler for the first time and, you know, see how good it is. But really the real one is 2024. And Really, Saturday was the first time that we saw this version of this 2024 team. And I think there's it's a combination of we didn't see, nobody saw the best players. <laughs> the, the best players that Penn State has didn't play, right? Overwhelmingly. Uh, the ones who did play look pretty good, right? Mm-hmm. There, there was there was plenty there. Uh, Abdul Carter looked great. Uh, Zaki Wheatley had an interception, AJ Harris, right? All of the defensive things are still there and, and you expect DeAndre wasn't. So that's that. Yeah. Uh, Julian Fleming wasn't right. Had a catch, but wasn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. Trey Wallace was pretty good, but, but you know, Hey, is now you have an idea. Are these guys going to be to the level they need to be? to compete with a schedule that is not on the high end as difficult as it was last year, but in the medium, much more difficult than it was last year. Can, can they, can they win games against those types of teams? We'll see. Fitz, what are you thinking about today? Uh, I, I know you had a little bit of a chance to, to see some of the things back that you were thinking about, but what's on your mind this morning? I, I'm just going to go back to before the blue white game. What do you take out of that? I mean, Number one, the weather. Like I, it seems like people are. Some people are writing that off to see what they want to see, but like that was miserable. Go to the post game reaction video on our YouTube. Scroll to two oh eight and watch my <laughs> credentials slap Greg Pickle in the face. I thought I was going to put his eye out. <laughs> that was awesome. I made a gif of it. It's great. Um, but beyond that, like there was nothing that they showed in this offense. Like nothing. <laughs> You, you don't even get out of this thinking that they showed wrinkles of wrinkles, you know? So yeah. that's where I'm going with that. I'm just cautioning. I mean, a lot of people viewing from what I've seen on the Blue White Illustrated message board went in with a process that they were going to come out of the game with no matter what. And yeah. I see that on the internet. It, it happens. Their struggles. They need to get better. Absolutely. That was the main takeaway from James Franklin's press conference after the game is that passing game needs to improve. Um, he went to the summer thing a couple of times. Will it improve? I don't know. Nate, you don't know. T. Frank, you don't know. I don't know. There's elements there that we're just not going to know about until September, and that's fine. That's fine. Um, But to take anything away from it, I mean, look, you knew Bro Pribula does not have the arm that Drew Aller has. So when they're throwing into a 40-mile-an-hour win, his ball is not going to make it there. Like, that's that's not changing anything that we already knew, just like we – we know that Drew Aller is not the athlete that Bo is. I mean, it's just so, so like we're just talking ourselves into these arguments mm-hmm. while not seeing anything tangible that we can really take away from it. So 
it's just a it's just a put it in a box and and keep it in in mind because there were mm-hmm. some good things that we saw on Saturday. There were some bad things that we all saw on Saturday. There are things that you can maybe transfer to the fall. Drew's footwork, you can transfer that to the fall. Yep. Beyond that, there's there's really not much you can take away from. So I'm excited to talk about it, but also talk about it in the proper context. Yeah, and and we strive here on the BWI Live Show to provide proper context. Uh, we're not the hot take show. Um, which is probably why we're not more famous, but I'm good with that. Um, so let's get into it. Let, let's talk a little bit about the passing game specifically. Nate, you had, speaking of our post-game conversation, you had the perfect line. Pass game purgatory. After the windy performance, it you know, the, the gusts of wind. I was looking at uh, some of the different factors of when they were throwing into the wind versus when they were throwing with the wind. I was using um, napkins that were blowing onto the field as an indicator of how much weather was on any particular play when somebody was throwing the football. So yeah, multiple layers in terms of the analysis of this football game. But what from the passing game would interested you other than I think the this is the part I want to start with. Uh, we, we went into this game all expecting with the weather, mm, we're going to see a lot of running. Well, 34 attempts by the white team, so throwing much more than any of us expected. But yeah. in that context, what else did you see? Uh, this is this is small, but I think indicative, maybe, of what's to come. I saw Trey Wallace make someone miss. Right? Yeah. Uh, it was earlier in the scrimmage, and he caught, I don't know, was it 15, 19 yards, maybe? And made someone miss and I, that that's a thing that's a thing with this is that one of the state receiving core wrinkles right? that is... they put into the playbook without with <laughs> making someone miss yes. yeah and it was good yeah, read by drew coach. that was disguised coverage he read it correctly he got the ball out there quickly and allowed him the opportunity to go make a guy miss so from a passing game perspective it's hopeful that's that's I, some good signs i i guess this is where like this is kind of where i loop back to is all right you know that you're not going to see scheming open type stuff, right? I mean, I guess, I guess to a certain extent what that defies what you just said. So yes, you do see a little bit of that, but you're not going to see, you're not going to see what they have right in store. They, they're not going to show you any of that stuff. So to, to me, it is the purest representation of where's the athleticism and skill yes. of, of these players, right? That like, just at its most simplistic is uh, Quentin Martin, right? Uh, making a play or making a cut in space. Uh, what does that look like? Because they're allowed to do that. <laughs> like You're not going to get your head knocked off, but yeah, yeah. you can do that. That's a thing that uh, is able to be on display. Uh, and so, yeah, ABR, I see, I, like, I get it. I, I understand. Talk about a low bar, but that's something that didn't happen last season. Right. Yes. On the whole, if we're talking about what the receivers did last season, if you talk about this is not J- Nate, not just last year, we're going back to 2022 with this group saying, I remember being at winter practice last year, spring practice last year in March and hearing J Juan Sider say lowest yak of any team in the big 10 or whatever he said to his guys when they were in their tackle breaking drill. So this is two years now in yeah. a row where they've talked about making guys miss. So, Low bar, yes, but that's where this these receivers and this passing game is. They 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 okay. No, like step one, catch the ball. Okay, they did that plenty last year. They they caught most of the passes, but nobody did anything resembling what Parker Washington did against Ohio State two yeah. years ago, and that's and that's the issue. So if there are some signs of hope. For Penn State, along those lines, I, I think you could take a little bit of something from that, especially in the absence of Keandre, who was kind of uh, universally acknowledged, I would say, within the program as being the guy that made everybody miss. Yeah, big plays, whether or not it was tackle breaking or breaking angles. I think there's, um, you know, it's important to have those distinctions too. I think Trey Walls can break some tackles. Fitz, um, Maybe a low completion percentage, but we can get to in a second. But big plays, part of the the offense yesterday. We saw some downfield passes despite the wind. 
They did throw it downfield. That was good. I mean, you threw it downfield to the guys that I think you wanted to throw. You wanted to test it downfield to us. So that was good. Um, you also got uh, pick plays and sort of levels that you were working with before. Yeah. I mean, hey, man, low bars are low bars. Like we're we're excited by the little things here um, because you want to see some sort of some sort of growth. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they were able to throw not not able to throw the ball downfield, but they did throw the ball downfield. Um, it was more interesting than last year, I guess. Um, but spring games, man, <laughs> this is where we're at. I'm curious to see yeah. where they go in the next couple of years, more so than uh, evaluating what we're going to look for in the 2025 spring game. So th this is, we've kind of talked around it, but um, both quarterbacks under 50% or at 50% completion percentage in the game. Wind is a factor. What do you guys think of that Nate what do you think what are your current opinions on trying to discern what's important to know about the consistency of the passing game from yesterday or yeah, Saturday would, I, excuse me I, I would have to go back and watch more closely but I felt I, again this is just kind of an instinctive reaction that a lot of the misses weren't close yeah and and because of that it's it's a Again, perfect purgatory. How much was the wind involved? How much was Drew Aller's mechanics involved? And how much were the receivers doing what they were supposed to be doing? And I don't know the answers to any of those. <laughs> like, I don't. I, I can't sit here and yeah. say definitively. I'm sure they're sitting in the film room today and having they know right, like the the. Drew knows what was a bad pass, right? Bo Perbula's pass to the sideline that was intercepted. I, I have no idea what happened there, right? Like, what was that? Did he was have pressure a... in his face fits on that one? I think he had Ty Blanding coming directly in his face on that. And both I don't know if it was a, a throw pressure away. in their face. I, I don't remember that one offhand, but both guys dealt with pressure all day, more so Bo. I mean, which, you know, he obviously moves around pretty well, but like, yeah, you, you had a lot coming at you on that one. Just, you know, no Dunka, no Nelson know some of those other guys in there they've played Wormley was not in there as yep. well so you know you you've got issues with pass protection which is basically a blue white game bingo piece you have that every year <laughs> yeah for sure Wait, and, and no offense even, to those those yeah. those guys up front the the white team you know you had some starters and some guys that weren't necessarily starters exactly but guys who were part of the two deep and then you're getting into some run on players, true freshmen that are 250 pounds playing tackle. Like there's a little bit of a, a five alarm fire in terms of pass protection abilities and expectations on, on the blue squad. So I, I wonder how much the offensive line in general was a part of why we saw less running and why they wanted to get. And the other thing was they played exclusively 11 personnel. So three receivers, one tight end. We know that's not going to be the offense this coming year. I, I talked to Caden Saunders after the game, and I was like, I, I asked him, what percentage of the offense did we see? And he he kind of chuckled and said, maybe 5%, maybe. Yeah. So uh, do you think from a coach level fits, the passing game, what we saw specifically, they wanted to work on these things. So it's not necessarily you know, indicative of anything other than what they want, what the coaching staff wanted to work on in their final scrimmage. Yeah, there's value in it for them. There's not value, much value in it for the fans, basically. Um, yeah. But you you work on those, you know, those roots, which are basically your base roots that you go out of. And then, you know, there's there's more um, branching out, if you will. Um, there was a lot, I thought, of miscommunications, like a lot of throws that as soon as the throw was gone, yeah. they start chirping at each other, which is fine. I mean, you've got to get on the same page somehow. But there's, a, I think there was a lot of that. It's better when it happens in April than when it happens to Dante Cephas and October, you know, that's <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of where you're at with that. So you, the, some of the things that you kind of expect to go along with it, um, you know, the, the, the worrisome parts, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about last season about the, you know, Drew's feet and not so much happy feet, but like getting settled on the back foot and then, you know, rocking back and throwing some of his yep. dump offs and things like that. You know, I think that that's, that's the concern that you kind of take away is that's still there. Um, and you didn't yeah. expect it to completely go away, but you want to see a little bit of progress moving forward in, in that aspect. And I think it's, for the most part, correctable. Uh, you know, some of that stuff is innate, but for the most part, correctable. So we'll see where that goes. I'm just not overly worried about it other than it's still sticking around. Yeah. The, I'd say the, the part that I noticed because it was more noticeable this year, 
during this particular game is we, we know that, you know, he had a tendency last year to bail from a clean pocket, drift out to his right, do some of these things that are comfort in the pocket pocket level things. I thought he did a better job of resetting and um, managing pressure, managing the pocket. I still think sometimes he looked uncomfortable in a compressed pocket, but he did a better job of, of having his composure. The problem was when he was moved off the spot, it's still the ball was inaccurate. And, and again, wind, because those throws were 15 yards down the field on a, uh, on a deep crosser or a deep over. How do you how do you gauge those particular plays in terms of is that Drew's accuracy or is that Drew's um, mechanics? The ones that I, I kind of give him a pass on are when they're throwing with the wind and throwing the deep ball. So the Caden Saunders play and uh, even Ethan Grunkmeyer had one where he had a cover two play that he was going to lay in there to uh, Luke Reynolds, but the wind caught it and it went an extra 15 yards. So I think it was actually harder to throw with the wind than it was to throw against the wind on Saturday. That's actually a good point because people just say, "Hey, how many, how, how often did he go against the wind?" Because that's when it changes it. Well, I, I mean, it, it it's a different sort of, um, it's a different sort of feel both ways, and it's and it's to turn it on a dime to go quarter, 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 quarter is good because you'll learn to do it. But at the same time, it's it's something that you have to adjust on the fly. So that's a good point. It's not just about throwing into the wind. It's 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 throwing crosswind. It's throwing with the wind. Things like that. Um, the receiver performance we talked about trey wallace anyone else stand out to you guys in terms of oh that was something i hadn't seen before i I liked or didn't like any of that nate do you have some guys you want to talk about yeah i didn't again i i left the experience thinking james franklin talked afterwards about there being a bunch of guys that caught the ball right and in sheer number that that is encouraging right to to a certain extent you have you have a bunch of players that can catch the football right fine stupid enough uh the the issue was the targets versus catches Mm -hmm. (laughs) right so like everybody nobody had a clean nobody had a caught every target that was sent to their their way, right? Like yeah. everybody had from a meaningful level. Some guys, well, I think, maybe had one catch, one target, but like anyone who saw multiple targets. But Caden had like six targets, caught two yeah. balls, right? Uh, yeah, tra- traded traded pretty well. It was seven and five, I think. Um, but j- just about everybody had multiple opportunities. And again, like it, it's it's too broadly speaking. I understand that I'm acknowledging the flaw in the argument, but it's still like okay. Uh, you know, who, who is that guy and they need that guy. And very clearly it appears to be trending toward Trey Wallace, but who's going to help him who like it, it has to be more than one. It has to be it has to, every year, right? There's always this, uh, there's always this very strange, like how we remember things mm-hmm. and you don't need five. You don't. You don't need five receivers to to catch double digit balls. You need, but you do need three. You, you got to be there. And yeah. after after number one, I'm not sure where two and three yeah are coming from. Put put a pin in that thought um, because we do have to get to something here on the show, um, and that is today's show sponsor, which is uh, the campaign to elect Brandon Short. Steve Wegman and Carl Nassib for the Penn State Alumni Trustees. Uh, their key issues are making Penn State more affordable, improving Penn State school ranking, and honoring the past and supporting future of athletics. Brandon, Steve, and Carl are aligned on their vision and are the best candidates to lead Penn State into the future. Voting is from April 10th to May 2nd, so it is open right now. Go to PennStateVotes.com. The link is in the description of the video if you want to go vote right now. Brandon Short, Steve Wagman, and Carl Nassib for Penn State Board of Trustees. Uh, Nate, one of the things that we've talked about here, and Fitz, I'll, I'll loop you in on this one. Um, are we talking just specifically receivers, or are we talking pass catchers? Because uh, top three guys, you would imagine, contributing the offense, we're not out there. Katron Allen, Nick Singleton, and Tyler Warren. So I, I think you do need at least three receivers, personally. But yeah, what are we doing here in terms of um, feeling about the the blend that they've got to work with based what we saw uh, on Saturday? You, you Fitz, didn't you see... Think? Sorry, go oh, ahead. I thought you were going to Nate. 
So go ahead. That was my, well, no, I did a terrible job. Like I you, did an absolutely mate, awful job reading, setting it up. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you didn't see, you didn't see all of the complimentary pieces. And so because of that, that, that shades things for sure. Mm -hmm. Look, I, no pressure, but if, if Singleton is the guy I think he is, that changes things for everybody else. That changes things for Drew. That changes things for the receivers. That changes things for the tight ends. If the tight ends, right? If, if Tyler Warren is the guy that everybody thinks he is, that changes things. And so, I, you know, not to be too like reductive, but it them not playing, yeah, has a huge impact. Four fifths of the starting offensive line potentially didn't play. <laughs> all, all of that stuff, yeah. all of that stuff influences how we perceive that game. But I, I, I also think it's too, it's a cop out to say that there's nothing to be gained, right? That you can't, that there's nothing to see in, in that game. There, there are things to see. Uh, it's just a matter of how much are those things that you were seeing going to be influenced by the things that you didn't see. Yeah. Fitz, what do you think? It's a good cover. Um, I think Tyler Warren's going to be very important for this offense. Um, I, Nate was just talking about who's the second or third guy. Well, I think Warren's in the top three in terms of receiving, but it doesn't eliminate that hole. It kind of softens the blow there. So I think he's in there. Um, Rappelier, I thought was up and down on Saturday. Khalil Dinkins, I think we're going to see a bunch of that, um, yeah. but in a different role. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see you know, how, how much momentum that tight end room has coming out of the spring because they're they're talented. Obviously, Rappelier got, got the touchdown at the end as well. So um, there's that. Somebody mentioned Liam Clifford. I thought Clifford, you know, if, if that's what you're going to use him as, that's a great role. Like, I think that that's what you're looking at if you're trying to make him your number three. Guy that moves the sticks. He had two two catches for 23 yards. I mean, you have a three or four catch game. I mean, that's an important, important role. Um, so I think Clifford was in there. Yeah. I thought Omari Evans actually moved pretty well. Like, that's the thing that we're talking about here when James says, hey, the talent's there. Like, you yeah. can see Omari do the things that, you know, talented wide receivers do. Got to finish off some catches. Got to do some some other things. I, I believe he was, was he the one, one of the ones that drew a pass interference, which I think is something we probably didn't talk about enough last year with the receivers. Like, if you don't make the catch, okay. But, like, put yourself in a position to draw a flag. That's what Ohio yeah. State does extremely well. Um, yeah. is is to put themselves in position to get those extra yards. Trey got one down by the end zone where Belgrave Shorter gra grabbed him. Um, I think there was two or three. Kimber got flagged for one. I didn't like that call, but we're not here to complain about officiating in the spring game if we are. <laughs> um, but you can see that there's elements of talent here. I'm curious to see yeah. what that room looks like in a week with Keandre reportedly hurt, hitting the portal. How does that change things? Uh, from a retention standpoint, how does that change things from a, a talent standpoint? Uh, th there's so many great questions with that receiver room. And as again, it's not something we can all answer on the Monday after the Blue Way game. Yeah, there were some, um, I think, good from a base perspective. This will be my last thought on this. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get to some palate cleansers. Then we'll get back to uh, the Blue White game and talk about some guys that stood out. Uh, I mean, we mentioned most of the receivers, so we'll, we'll focus on defense and some other positions. Um the choices Aller was making, one of the things you brought up, and I'm going to bring this up in a film room this week of uh, fourth and five, late, I think, in the second half. Yes, Aller has an open completion to a running back, but the matchup and the situation with the tight end is the one you want. It's on the tight end to not get pushed out of bounds by a defensive end. So there, there's there's a couple of things that at play in, in some of those decisions that you like from Drew Aller. I thought, again, more aggressive with the football, um, but more aggressive doesn't matter if it's not on target. Uh, speaking of Aller, the fuss over the jugs machine was so silly before Drew cleared it up. Catching the ball wasn't the issue for those that watched. It was uh, everything else. So to comment on what J Ben is talking about here, um, and, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here, one of the reporters... Uh, after the game, everyone is trying to put out information to you as fast as possible. And one of the reporters uh, discussed what Drew was saying about using the jugs machine and, and Julian Fleming coming in and teaching the players how to use the jugs machine. Now, for those that don't know, the jugs machine is the thing that makes the football fly through the air. Just you put it on and you launch it. That is not what Drew was talking about because everyone was then taking a turn dunking on Penn State receivers on Twitter that they haven't been using the jugs machine. So I posted the clip of what he actually said on, on my Twitter. You can check that out. But just for clarity, so that everyone's on the same page, here is what he said. But I think 
the biggest thing is like we have like the Monarch, on, like the the jugs machine, the Monarch that like is like a seeking one or whatever. He's been putting that to the use a lot, and I think that's helped the receivers a lot because we probably haven't used it um, as much. Well, we definitely haven't used it as much, and I think him showing the receivers how it's used and how much benefit they can gain from that because obviously, like, I want to throw to them all the time, but I also have to limit myself in the amount of throws that I can get in in a week just to, you know, prevent uh, anything else from happening from that standpoint. But I so there you go. There's your answer. Uh, do do you have any additional comments on this? Um, do you find it interesting that they have a they have a tool, but they don't necessarily know or use it the same? This is, I think, imagine is more of um, when players are working in the summer on their own and it's not organized. This is a tool that is there for them to use, but not necessarily one that they're all going to use. It, Nate, is, is that a fair assessment of kind of the the conversation around this? Can you can you clarify the difference between the jugs machine and the monarch judge machine jugs machine? Excuse me. Yeah, Fitz, do you want to take it or do you want? Yeah, I can... the monarch is like throwing you routes. Like the jugs yeah. machine is a pitching machine, basically. So you're you're there and you're waiting for the ball to come and you're toughening up your hands. Supposedly, sorry, I got in front of my mic, toughening up your hands. Where the monarch can actually, you can program it to throw the ball where you want it to go, throw the arc, throw all these different things that makes you. You know, it simulates it coming out of a quarterback's hand. The dumb stuff here is it's it's more about the methodology. It's more about like putting yourself in the most efficient way to get the work done that you need to to get better. It's not about the machine itself or that receivers weren't working to get better. It's about taking the I mean, th we're talking about this guy like a freaking uh, Dalai Lama, like talking to these receivers that have never, you know, touched a football before. Like that, that's not what this is. Yeah. It's about learning to work as if they were, you know, in a different room in Ohio State's room and taking what they know and adding any sort of, you know, sponge, being a sponge and taking what they can take in. It's not yeah. a situation where they're not working. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that there's I think that there's probably parallels to and I can't remember if Sean Clifford said it or maybe even Drew last year, but the effectively. You, you have guys that watch film at like they log hours and hours and hours and hours of film watch, right? At, at film mm -hmm. study and have no idea what they're looking at, <laughs> right? Like some people on to, the internet would say, that's me. That's me too. Yeah. That, well, <laughs> except for the hours and hours. Uh, but you, you get the idea, right? Is early in your career, if, if somebody doesn't teach you how to watch film and the things that you're looking for, the things that are applicable, then you can put all the time in the world into doing that specific aspect of your preparation. And it's not, it's not benefiting you. It's mm -hmm. not giving you the, the payoff that th there are other ways that the further you progress in your career and the more you, that you're around a guy, I mean, that's again, the number one thing about Julian is uh, it, it, you know, this is very premature and stupid. So strike this from the record if it's not true, but he has some Sean Clifford in him in terms of the perception of him from others on the team being, Hey, this, like this guy is all about his business. Like he just, he, right. So I think that there's probably some limitations on the high end of mm -hmm. what elite is, preparation, elite preparation that yeah. serves him well. And, and, more importantly, can serve as an influence to the other guys, the other guys in that room. Uh, JC Corgan says this in the chat. He says, T Frank, uh, we went to the restaurant and they served us chicken. I, I think this is his analogy for the game. As you discuss pass catchers, what kind of distribution changes do you see from your to Andy Cole, Nikki? That's one of those things we can't really answer because of the blue white game. Um, but it is, I, I would say last year, the offense and the point of the offense was to serve the defense. So that was the offensive personality. It, they were more, I get generally Mike Yersich picked a receiver, you know, you think Jahan Dotson 2021, that is the focus of the offense. Keandre Lambert Smith was the focus of the offense last year. I don't think we have enough information to know exactly who the focus of the offense is going to be this upcoming season. Chad Landers says, that's what I want to hear from T Frank. Chad, I don't know specifically what you meant here. You got a couple of things in the chat, so I don't want to respond to the wrong thing. Let me know what you want me to respond to later, uh, later on. But we had to get um, that one up there. Yeah. Yeah. I was confused. <laughs> I didn't want to leave him on red. 
So I wanted to make sure, like, you know, whatever you want to hear, I I'm here for it. But I just didn't want to, I want to make sure we didn't have the wrong thing. Um, what were we talking about? Because I totally, totally got derailed by that. Probably the passing game. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's move on. Let's, let's, let's move on uh, to something a little lighter. And that's the transfer portal. We'll get back to the blue white game here in a second, but the transfer portal opens uh, tomorrow, guys. I think so. Oh, yeah. uh, let's give a primer to everyone watching about the transfer portal and what is about to happen. And I'm going to start with this in the chat because Nate, I want you to once again. I've seen this two or three times on the internet. Uh, please explain to people that this is not exactly where we are when it comes to the transfer portal. Chad says, uh, "Not not picking on you, Chad." There are they also the elf in the room that over 10 guys are going to have to make room on for scholarships. The Penn State will have to weather that next storm. Penn State, we've talked about this a bunch of times. They're over scholarships. Everyone wants to know how they're getting to under the scholarship limit. Are they going to have to cut 10 players in order to make room for the 85 scholarship limit? No. Okay, why? Because it's uh, all of this is money laundering, right? So let's just clarify that college athletics is mon money laundering. That's what it is. Uh, and so you just pick and choose where your money is directed to. And so the NCAA says you have to have 85 full scholarships, right? And, and wrestling's the same way we can have this, like wrestling has what nine scholarships that they right? Mm -hmm. And, but instead of using nine scholarships, they break it up into other players. And so they like, you don't actually get a full scholarship necessarily if you're a wrestler, Football is the same way. Okay, yeah, they're going to have 85 full ride scholarships for sure. But NIL changed things. And even before NIL, I think that there were some things, whether Penn State was doing it or not, but uh, right there, it's uh, creative accounting, right? Today's tax day, creative accounting, right? You figure, <laughs> you, you, yeah. you, figure, you figure out where your tax breaks are. You figure out uh, what, are, what are the things that we can maximize the rules to the, the best of our ability. And in the NIL era, the best way to do that is to say, hey, kid who is not on scholarship but has played really well and has earned a scholarship, we we don't we don't have a scholarship for you in the traditional sense. But you're going to get paid from the collective the amount or more that that scholarship's value is. And so there I do think that there are some implications, right? Once you get into Fitz, you can correct me on this, like preseason camp, there's numbers, there's right in terms of how many players they can have in preseason camp that in that messes up walk-ons that can be there, that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a, there's a cap on numbers for preseason camp that I believe they just e expanded to, to 120. It was at 110. So every year you get a couple of guys, whether it be injured guys, maybe freshmen or something like that, um, that just don't make the roster that come on. Uh, I believe the first day of classes is when they're allowed to come on. Gotcha. But that's not going to impact the the 10 over, right? Or whatever it is, whatever they end that's up roster at. Roster spots, not scholarship, not the 85 that we've become accustomed to. Yeah, the, the 80, just, just forget the 85, right? It, does it exist in reality? Yes. For practical purposes, does it exist? No. If Penn State, the football program, wants to have a player on its roster, it can do that. <laughs> no matter, they no matter won't, what the full they scholarship. won't talk about it. The, the James no, Franklin won't. asked about this. So if you if you want to know, yeah. get the information. This is all this is all the game now, right? Nate, this is the this is the transfer portal game. How do we maximize the benefit? Right. So yeah. and and I think that I think that in some ways it can include reshuffling guys who may have had a scholarship at one point in their career, too, right? Uh, yeah. in, in the sense that when they do those they do those surprise videos every August and it's like, Oh man, you're on scholarship and you weren't before. Well, you, you might not be after the season. And that yeah. was always, that was always the case, uh, right. That, that it was kind of a one year deal. I, I think that, I think that that is, yeah, that's it. I have nothing. It, more it, it's going to be a sheet turned in at some point that has 85 names on it. Says this is our scholarship guys. Trust us. And that's what well, you got. <laughs> and, and even, even, on the technical level, like I think that there's a disconnect with what people understand of how room and board is paid out, right? Mm -hmm. Like you get a check, you get a check from the university that 
has the number of what the maximum value of room and board on Penn State's campuses. So the highest meal plan, all, all of that stuff, you get a check for that. And so what you see with a lot of other athletes, not football necessarily, and football does the same thing, but you, you get the maximum amount of check that you can, and then you spend it on the least amount that you possibly can for right. rent. So one way, one way, for instance, to work around this is if you've got a deal with whatever, one of the, one of the development companies or apartment companies in state college as right. An NIL deal, right. You don't pay rent, right. For the place that you're living in, but also you get, you still get a check for room and board. Right. And so that's just, a, it's a, it's a creative accounting way to work around what the NIL deal is. So in this case, you're just getting paid by it. it it's the mafia. That's yes. that's all it is. is it, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just the cigarettes fell off the back of the truck. Like that's <laughs> that's what this is at this point. For people uh, listening on the podcast, Jacob uh, Reynolds here in the chat, I think described this perfectly. He says, "My God, can we just get collective bargaining already?" I am over this because Nate, you're going two or three levels deep on how to game the system and how to max it. Like there are, I'm not surprised that you are getting more and more people filtering into college football around all of this stuff, because how is a, how is a college player supposed to focus on being the best athlete and student possible while also having all the information about how to handle all this stuff. And I'm sure there's probably some people at Penn state who can direct you in the right blah, 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 all those things. But there's so many different hoops to jump through here that have nothing to do with football. They have nothing to do with basketball, sports in general. Um, let's get a little bit back towards the transfer portal. Uh, Fitz, you mentioned. I thought you were taking us into an ad read there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're clear. We're clear for now. Um, the So 85 is not the problem here. 85 right. is not the number. But that doesn't mean there won't be an exodus of players given the football side of things that happened over the weekend. So uh, Keandre Lambert-Smith, we've talked about him, the likely first portal entry we know of. And again, definitely happening, but journalistically, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. We have to clarify that he's not officially in the portal to our knowledge. Are, what are you looking for in terms of portal movement from the team and kind of give us a, a guideline of how to read the next couple of days and maybe week? So number one with Keandre, I believe he's finishing up his degree this spring. Okay. And that means he can't go in until tomorrow, until Tuesday, because he's not a graduate transfer. So this window is open for non-graduate transfers. If you're a graduate transfer, you can go in whenever. Um, but no, this is a situation where a lot of the football aspect, of, more so than the money aspect of it, from I think from a Penn State state of, well, point of view, a lot of football aspect. You watched the spring game this week. There's a depth chart. You know, there's a lot of guys stacked in a lot of positions. When you're over that 85, which Again, not meaningful at this point. When you're over that 85, it means you got a lot of bodies on that roster, which means guys are going to get filtered to the bottom that they want to look in at better or more uh, better decisions for themselves. I guess we can say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's I more think more opportunity, we're maybe. Yeah, opportunities. The the word that was escaping me there. That would that, yeah, that would have been much better. Um, <laughs> but I think there's so it's interesting looking at recruiting, looking at portal. Like we talk, some people just want to say recruiting is all nil now. A big chunk of it is not. A big chunk of it is the stuff, the conversations that we've always had. It's just that, you know, it, it seems different because there are guys that are turning, whose recruitments turn on a dime and you can point it and pretty clearly say it's NIL. That's not for everybody. I don't know want to put a percentage on it, but also in the transfer portal, like there are, will be guys across the country that will go out and look for the best potential deal to benefit them, the best opportunity to benefit themselves, both financially, playing time, all that kind of stuff. But there's still a football aspect to it. These guys still want to play football. They're still on this roster. They're still providing a role that maybe they don't think is good enough. And that's that's a conversation that goes back no matter who the coach is at Penn State, I mean, yeah. no matter what's, uh, which college you're playing at across the country. So there's still elements of this stuff because I think we want to you know, throw our hands up and say it's all transfer portal. It's all NIL. Everything's ruining the sport. Sport's broken, whatever. Um, but there's still elements of what you've always watched that are in there. So I think that that's yeah. what you're going to see. Um, top of the line guys in uh, ma ma mainly talking about national college football, top of the line guys are going to go in and it's going to be bidding wars. It's going to be free agency. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But the majority of guys that go into the portal are coming off the bottom of your depth chart. And I think that that's what we're going to see right now is how do you adjust at receiver? 
You've got three receivers coming in. You got 15 scholarships. I know that we just talked to you for five minutes about how scholarships don't matter, but it's it's roster building, it's roster structure, yeah. and things like that. So, how does receiver evolve? How do these positions where you've got a lot of guys? Well, you know, you look at corner. Um, you've got six guys that you think can play. Reality of the situation there, you know. It, probably not going to have a six man rotation at corner mm-hmm. tight end is really good Re- running backs really good. so you've got these spots where these uh position ch- that position churn that attrition that we see every year is coming along and then you add to that that penn state didn't have much turnover uh, as much turnover as we thought it would in the winter period with christian driver alex paquetta uh, ibrahim Traor. you know the the list was very short and not mm-hmm. surprising i guess you could say so i think that that's what you're setting up for as a penn state fan to see some of that typical attrition more so than you know if there's a shock move, I mean, you can't write anything off here because yeah. this is a different age, a different era and things like that. If there's a shock move, so be it. But like the, yeah. the majority of the portal turn, I think, is going to be a little, little bit lower on the on the on the sites there. We're not going to get into individual players or anything like that. That would be inappropriate for us to just randomly speculate about stuff like that. But a general rule would be if it's a guy who you didn't see a whole lot of during the blue white game, but still played and, and you know, kind of those depth chart conversations maybe those are the areas you you would look at in terms of where to expect a guy to go into the portal but nate this is the this is the perpetual conversation this time of year to fold yeah. back in on nil and kind of put a a cap on this conversation so we can get back to talking about dudes in the blue white game uh what's the threat here another year into nil that portal inducement can happen of players seeking monetary windfall from other schools not necessarily tied to what we just talked about with Fitz. Re- rephrase the question what is the threat like yeah how yeah is penn state insulated enough from other schools no. coming in and buying nope. players off their roster nope <laughs> okay no they're not uh it that's not yeah but no, that's uh, well. Look, that's just that's that's constantly the case, and they talk about it. Uh, you are re-recruiting your your current roster right now. That that is today, tomorrow, Wednesday, right? James went through all of the the schedule, and then he's going to have three weeks of individual player meetings. But that's what has been happening really throughout the spring. Is you are trying to convince your current players to come back. I hate to go to basketball, but like Ace Baldwin still hasn't made an announcement, right? He still hasn't decided uh, publicly what he's going to do. That there, this is just this is just where it is, and you don't have to go into the portal, like right? We we understand that. Is it technically against the rules to tamper and to to have other schools be involved with your players of course it's technically against the rules no yeah. one cares no one cares that's what's happening right now is you have players or representatives from the school whatever who have other represent that's how basketballs work for forever and now i think you're seeing more of it in the college football game where you everybody has handlers agents what have you that serve as middlemen and can get a grasp on what the hypothetical offer is right yeah. what, what it's not hypothetical it's real this is, yeah <laughs> this is what it's supposed to be so yeah you're you are constantly having to fend off those threats and some of that also includes purposeful bidding up of a player mm-hmm. so, so that it costs you said so it costs you more gotcha. to keep them well, that's fun. There's another there's another layer to the game, um, and there's not a GM uh, for for sports yet. So, fi- finding finding all of these things. Let's get to the blue white game. There's there's that's a rat that's a rat's nest of different conversations. Let's get to the blue white game. Fitz, let's end on a strong note. Dudes that stood out. I'm gonna give you uh, the floor. Who did you thought? Who did you think from an individual level? You know, one of the best things that we can do in the blue white game is just say who played well, who maybe didn't play well, who played well in your mind. Well, to shift the wind away from the mafia and money laundering <laughs> from my esteemed colleague here, uh, I'm going to go with AJ Harris, um, Penn State's transfer portal edition, uh, big, I think biggest transfer portal edition uh, this offseason. I thought he played well, uh, especially in the first half. Um, he looked the part of a Big Ten corner, and that's what we were hoping to see. That's kind of the feedback that we've heard, um, and it'll be interesting to see where he falls in that pecking order. Um, to me, if you're Terry Smith, you keep that thing as open as possible. You don't 
name starters. You don't do anything. But the other thing that they do at the end of the spring is they're going to sit down and they're going to write where they think they belong in that pecking order. And sometimes those numbers align. Sometimes they don't. Um, I think last year, Storm Duck put himself at fifth and then left. So that, you know, that's kind of like where you're at with, uh, with this whole mindset of how do you fit into the room? But I think AJ Harris seems like he fits really well. I'm excited to see him. He had some good coverage as well. Um, the physical stuff is yeah. kind of his hallmark, but the coverage was there as well. Yeah, he he was fighting with the top receivers and and seemed like he was um, making things hard for the passing game. Nate, who did you think stood out to you in your expert opinion? Can I I didn't put this in the list, but can I steal a mean Vanover? Is Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's Franklin afterwards pumped him up a little bit. Obviously, he made a play, made a nice interception there, mm -hmm. uh, but all of the conversation this off season has rightfully been on Abdul's change to the defensive end and yep. deny at that position. But again, you need more than two at that, yeah. you know, I at think the I, defensive end spot. So I thought it was notable too, that uh, talking about Abdul, if we can, you know, finish up here on a mean, but Abdul wasn't the starter on the white team. You know, he was a situational pass rusher. And we were wondering how this would all shake out from a depth perspective and who'd be the starters. And I think it's meaningful that Amin was the starter in the blue white game and was with that first unit, Nate. Yeah, we're going to see, right. We're going to see, we're going to see how that, uh, how that shakes out. I think that it is naive to not think that Abdul will be used extensively, Yeah, but also, but also, um, like somewhat situationally, I, I I don't know. Like I I just think that everybody, the way that Amin said it afterwards, because I talked to him, was he was like, look, like Abdul coming to defensive end helps me, right? We will all have reps. You're all, we're all going to have opportunities. There's there's is more than enough to go around because you're playing at your highest. You're not the fatigue level is not a factor when you yeah. can have a, a, a rotation and depth that is as good as it appears to continue to be for that unit, even after losing two starting defensive ends. Fitz, what did you think of Abdul Carter? Uh, he's really good off the ball. Somebody mentioned that he was off sides. I, I don't, I didn't look that closely, but he didn't get called off sides. That's yeah, the there's a thing. couple times, but he, yeah, good, good jump on the snap for sure. Great jump. I mean, and, and you, we talked about that last week on the show about the differences in body type athleticism of that defensive end room. We talked about Jameel Lyons being the snap, like the, the, the twitchy guy. Uh, I, Carter's got a little bit of twitch to work with. So, yeah. um, Interested to see his uh, development in pass rushing attacks. He put on a spin move the other day that when he gets that down is going to make some people look silly. Um, it's not down yet. So um, he's going to continue to improve about, upon that. I think he's uh, he's on the right track. Uh, uh, far be it for me to doubt the athletic spectacle that, that is playing defensive end now. We have somebody who uh, talked about that expertly in T. Frank's film room. Landon Tangwall broke down Jameel Lyons and Abdul Carter and that spin move specifically. We talked, it wasn't just Abdul. I made, I made this point. I'll make it now. Lots of dudes were trying that spin move on Saturday um, from, from I think a mean on down. There's a lot of spin cycle out there. So just an interesting thing. You'll get more information over bluewhiteillustrated.com and T. Frank and Landon's film room later today on that particular one. Jameel Lyons was very good fits. He, Landon was very, very high on Jameel. What what did you think of his performance? Uh I'm sorry, that's a great line from the in the in the chat here. Um, Jameel is every bit of what I hope to see, just a, a wrecker, like a wrecking ball. Um, again, put him with Carter in the sense that he's got things to refine because he is right now just like clubbing people and going, um, which is great. It's fun to watch at least. Um, but yeah, he's, he's got some, some game wrecker in him and I'm like, you don't want to take away too much because the offensive tackles overmatched the offensive line overmatched. Yeah. We expected that going in, but like the twitchy, just get off the ball and go type things. There's a lot to like there. Um, yeah. just from talking to people in the building, maybe the highest ceiling out of any of them. Um, but still a ways to go in that situation. By the way, Joseph Mapoy um, got a sack in this game. Yeah. Uh, it, not close to being in the rotation. I don't think, but, really cool to see the i mean when he got here just 
walk him in a straight line and get him where he needs to be, that's great. But he's made progress, and that's really cool to see some of those guys sort of step up. Uh, a play in three parts that Fitz pointed out here in the chat. Kendrick Collins says they never talk about a Davian Collins. Corey Smith responds, are you an a Davian Collins fan? And Kendrick Collins rep- replies, yes. I am an Adavian Collins 29 fan since birth. So uh, I'm going to do some uh, detective work and imagine that Kendrick Collins is related to, uh, if not the father of uh, Adavian Collins. So welcome to the show. Super happy to have you. Um, we're well, let's talk excited. about Adavian Collins, shall we? Yeah, let's talk about him. All right. Penn State's got six corners they think are really good. And they got two freshmen that they think are really good as well. Collins came in. He came from Mississippi State um, for the background here. Redshirt freshman uh, basically took another redshirt year last year. Of course, when you take a look at Penn State's cornerback room last year, three guys are going to be drafted. Cam Miller played a bunch. Uh, Zion Tracy got in there as well. I think that where Collins came, and Terry Smith kind of said this last week, where Collins was last year at the end of the year to where he's gotten now has improved more than anybody in the in that room, basically. That's big when you take a look at the guys he's going up against. So. Did he jump Zion Tracy? Did he jump uh, Elliot Washington as well? That's a big deal because the, Terry Smith has played three, has even played, or excuse me, has played four, has even played five corners before. And I think uh, Davian Collins has put himself in a position with the work that, you know, from talking to people in the program all offseason, with the work that he put in this this winter, uh, really got where he needed to be. So I'm excited to see how that shakes out. Um, it's very interesting because you've got not only the, the, the elements of two transfers added to that room, and then three on top of that, when you talk about Collins last year, um, that's a lot of churning, if you will. So I'm very curious to see where that stays. But I, again, keep it open if you're Terry Smith. Um, get all those guys reps because it you just kind of give that room the benefit of the doubt because it's a really good uh, – it's become one of those assembly line rooms at Penn State. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very good – talent pool that Penn State is having compete right now. Right. Uh, Nate, we we have um, a lot of guys left on the list, a lot of good standouts. Let's get to the one that I think fans want to hear more about, and that is Quinton Martin. Um, what do you think of the running backs that did play on Saturday? Good. I, I didn't think anything was necessarily spectacular. I didn't I didn't think um, he had some big holes to work with it, from my recollection that, you know, were pretty good. I Look, uh, my expectation, forgive me, is that Nick Singleton and Katron Allen are going to have 95% of the carries, right? Uh, yeah, certainly you saw Trey, po- but I, I guess my point being is, I, is it important for development in that room? Because there will come a day probably sooner than later when Singleton and Katron aren't there. Absolutely. You got to start to get those guys up to speed and and ready to make their mark. And I'm sure they're chomping at the bit themselves, right? They're they're ready. They want all of those guys want to play and they want to play immediately. But you're just in a position in that room where being realistic, if you see Quentin Martin this year, and I expect that you will, uh, and certainly Cam Wallace is making a, a stab at that as well. But it's it's going to be on a limited basis. So we did get to learn a little bit more about Quentin though, Fitz. Um, I, I know he kind of piqued your interest after the game. We did. And when I was talking to somebody last summer um, during a camp, because because Quinton has always been the football player playing running back. You know, people as a receiver, is he a line? You know, people talk about linebacker early in his career or whatever. Um, but there was concerns because of how big he is, because of how tall he is, that, you know, he couldn't run low enough and things like that. Yep. I was talking to somebody last summer. They're like, yeah, we're not worried about that at all. He can he can figure that stuff out because of the type of athlete that he is. And I think he showed that this weekend. I will say maybe a little bit far over the skis right now. He couple of carries, a couple of touchdowns, pretty good ratio if he can keep that up. Um, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it, I think there's a thread on our board right now, you know, likening him to Kurt Warner. Let's, okay, let's just back it off a little bit. I think the potential is there. I'm excited to see him as a receiver, but I agree with Nate. Uh, those two or those three and four guys are, without sounding like a jerk, battling for scraps here because of the guys that are entrenched above them. So I'm curious to see how this does play out. And by the way, Cam Wallace was not bad at all on Saturday. Yeah. He was he looked pretty good, uh, really enjoyed the tough running. I think he had a fourth and one or a fourth and two where they had an inside zone, and he made the most of it, and he got the first down. And that's exciting to see because you see Cam beside uh, Quentin Martin, and obviously one guy is six, one and a half. The other guy, much shorter and uh, a little stockier. So um, different style. like looking at you and me. <laughs> yeah yeah something like that anyway um, i was um, but yeah, no sorry uh, wallace that. uh wallace caught the ball out of the backfield the one time uh he had a bad drop which obviously if you 
take a look at that role and what you need to be in that role. He's not Ronnie Harmon third down back. Like this is not how this offense works. Um, Cause you're going to have your, your studs out there as much as possible. But when you're in there, Trey Potts caught a few balls. Trey Potts did some nice things and you've got to do the complimentary stuff. Well, that drop's going to hurt him at some point. Um, but, uh, but we've heard good things on both those guys catching the ball. Uh, big aqua. Um, I think, makes a good point here. He says, I don't know who number 31 was on defense, but he was everywhere. Way more Colin Dinkins conversation uh, during the game than I expected. We do have to give him a shout out as he had a sack, an interception return for a touchdown, uh, several tackles. He was the lion. Somebody uh, asked it earlier in the chat, you know, did they play the lion position? The lion position is essentially a nickel. And when Penn State's offense is going 11 personnel the whole game, they were in the lion most of the game. There were a couple times where they had an, a, a the Sam linebacker in there on the on the blue team. But Colin Dinkins had a pretty good game without uh, your guy KJ Winston out there and Jalen Reed didn't play a whole lot in the game fits. Um, but one guy who I think, you know, not to just gloss over Colin Dinkins, but King Mack also looked pretty good in this particular performance. We're not glossing over Colin Dinkins right here. That guy played as a red shirt freshman on special teams in I think every game but one last year. That takes a special kind of effort and a guy that is as a walk on as athletic as some of those guys in that room. That's a really good room. And you mentioned he plays the lion. So that's going to add some versatility. It's going to give you the ability to just try and sneak on the field because that's what you're trying to do as, as a walk on right now. So I thought he looked great from the start. Um, he was in he I think he was the guy in the coverage downfield against Saunders on the far sideline yeah. uh, on the yeah. deep ball. Um, so he was in coverage. He was playing physical. He was doing some good things. Um, he has worked his way into the role that he has, and that's an important piece for that. So it's really cool. Uh, King Mac, on the other hand, a little bit more naturally gifted, I guess you could say. Um, he, guys finds the football. He finishes through the football. I'm really excited to see that. And he was back returning kicks, which I that's what I want to see. Selfishly, that's what I want to see. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. That's a really good point about that one. Okay, rapid fire here um, to, to end the show. Nate, give us a name and, and something that stood out about them. From the blue white game, super rapid, rapid fire. fire. Wow, that worked yeah. really well. Lightning round. <laughs> no, go to Fitz first, then I'll I'll come back. All right, I'm gonna throw one out there. Nolan Rucci, I thought looked. I, I looked first off. I got to see him play football. Um, that is not something I had seen a whole lot before. I was a little surprised at kind of the athlete that I saw, but for the most part, I thought he did a decent job of getting to his blocks, executing his assignment. There was Colin Dinkins, the sack he got came against Nolan Rucci. That's not great for a guy who's six, eight, but you know, I think the building blocks of an offensive lineman are there. It, it calibrated my expectations for Nolan. I think for this year fits who who's on your radar, uh, is that performed on Saturday. Yeah, Rucci at six eight. He's going to lean sometimes. That's what's going to yeah. happen, and then you're he's going to get caught out of place. And that's that's kind of what we saw. Dunko, by the way, for those that weren't following closely, was in pads, did not do anything in warmups, did not play. So that was disappointing to me because I really wanted to see uh, what he brings to the table in that right tackle battle. Um, Amin Vanover uh, re received effusive praise from James Franklin. After is that a you know a pitch to keep him around? Like right. you know he's a guy that is. But he started on Saturday, but you've got a, a cluster of really talented guys at defense end. So that that's one pile. On the other pile, like he could play football. Like he he did it last year and was sort of one of those underappreciated guys as we talked about Chop and we talked about Disa getting the sacks and things like that. But Amin played pretty well as well. And now this is his chance to step in, sort of step into the light. So I thought Amin Vanover played well. He had the pick on the uh the middle screen, which shows that he'd been around a while. Um has wasn't full <laughs> that and uh mm -hmm. went and made a nice play on the ball. But uh I mean Defensive end from top to bottom, as expected, the the dominating position in this in this scrimmage. Yeah. Uh Nate, you got anything now? Sure. Riley Thompson. Riley Thompson. Okay. W what did you see from Riley Thompson? He had a great punt. Great punt. Okay. Um No, it's Cooper important. Cup. Yeah, yeah. It is. But Penn State has Penn State has had pretty good punters over the last handful of years. And this is so mean. I suspect it'll be important for Penn State this year again. Oh, actually, that reminds me. Um, we do have an answer from uh, Chad Landers. He says he wants to know, should you be on the ledge this year? Um, are we still concerned after watching the game? Uh, are we off the ledge? Chad, um, some of the comments that I had about Drew Aller and, and his accuracy when moving off the spot, I think he's going to be moving off the spot a lot this year. So that's... Uh, 
well, I'm going to dig more into that, but I don't feel great about how everything's coming together. All right. That's going to have to do it for the show. Not to end on a bummer. How about this? Cooper Cousins look good, Fitz. Let's end on Cooper Cousins look good. Yeah. Yes. uh, Cooper Cousins did look good. By the way, 138 days. If you're planning on ledge standing, that's a long time to stand on a ledge till uh, (laughs) till West Virginia. So uh, Cooper Cousins look good. Tony Rojas. Uh, Somebody asked about the linebackers in the chat. I didn't take very much from the linebackers at all in this game. I, I don't. I mean, it's it, it's tough to to gauge that. Tony Rojas did had a, a really nice play where he finished, I believe, for a tackle for loss. Antoine Belgrave Shorter, the freshman corner, uh, physical, not there yet. Uh, had the grabbing penalty um, down late in the game against Trey Wallace, but showed a lot of very good things there. Um, I think that's probably all that I have written down. But we could probably do a play by play with this uh, if we wanted. To oh yeah, that. that's a good group. Yeah, it's like doing our top five list. There's you're never going to be right because you're going to leave somebody out. But that's the nature of the show. We've, we've Barker, talked for an yes, hour. That's it. We we need to uh, we need to move on to other things today. So these guys are going to have more reaction from the blue white game. We'll have more on the transfer portal when that news breaks. It's a great time to subscribe to Blue White Illustrated. And if you're here hanging out, having a good time with us, two months for a dollar with promo code PSU one, going to get you that inside skinny on transfer portal and more this summer. Because just because spring football is over doesn't mean the conversation stops. There's recruiting, all kinds of stuff that are ramping up. The future of Penn State football is going to be decided in part this summer on a bunch of different levels. So sign up and get two months for a dollar because you're here on the Blue White Illustrated live show or listening on the podcast. We love you guys, but we got to get going. That'll be it for us today. More on the Blue White game and recapping that coming up on the show tomorrow. So we'll talk to you then.